guys, good morning. Uh, everybody awake? I, I feel like maybe a few of you went to some after parties last night and be a little bit tired today. So I've got a great panel here that's going to wake you right up and get you thinking about all the important topics um, that you have uh, not heard enough about at Collision. <laughs> For example, AI. I'm pretty sure nobody has even heard AI mentioned so far, oh. so we're going we're gonna to be the ones yeah. who, who what, break What does it. that even stand for? What, what it, I, I what don't is know what that is, is actually. So, so uh, I did want to mention that, that this is actually Gideon Litchfield from Wired. <laughs> this uh, enigmatic figure is Harry McCracken from, uh, from Fast Company. And then, of course, we have Tracy Mabry. <laughs> Ooh, look at me getting that right. <laughs> from Dow Jones Factiva. And we're gonna talk a little bit about AI in the media, in particular the ethics. Um, so, you guys, <laughs> prior to this current wave of, of generative AI, um, well, notably the appearance of things like ChatGPT and, and Dolly, uh, we know that media companies were using AI already, right? Um, were you guys using AI in your organizations or maybe in your day-to-day -day life uh, in some way that you want to tell us about? And if so, how? Do you want to start us, Tracy? Okay. Go. Start. start well, I think, you know, per the introduction, I run Factiva. I'm part of Dow Jones. So we're both an aggregator of publications. And obviously, we are a peer of all of these fine folks in terms of the Wall Street Journal and the, and the Times and, and a series of global publications. So in both the way that we promote journalism and the way that we aggregate it from a Factiva perspective, we've been using AI, right, this word, um, really almost since the inception of the platforms, right? I think we're all looking at like generative AI and things, it's this brand new thing, but think about it as machine learning, you're applying metadata, all these very techy type of um, terms. We've been using that forever. Um, and that's you know a really important component as we look at this. This new horizon is going to be something, and I don't think we, any of us know exactly what that is yet, but we have been using the building blocks of it, I think, for quite some time. Best company, as far as I know, has not really been using AI in any formal way. Um, it's still very much about human beings crafting words and creating imagery. I'd say in terms of my own work, um, in retrospect, I have been using it for a while, and it has had an impact because I use Grammarly to um, take a look at almost everything I write, and I accept some of the suggestions, and th those are, have always been generated by a AI, and just lately it's gotten kind of s scary smart in a way th uh, that it couldn't have been a while ago. So um, yes, AI has had a little bit of impact on my writing for the last two or three years. Yeah, and, and I'd say for us, like a lot of places, I think we use AI transcription tools for transcribing interviews. That's an obvious use sometimes. Uh, sometimes if you're doing some reporting in a language for or write a story from with material from a country whose language you don't understand, use Google Translate just to help you give it, get a sense of it. So AI has obviously been in our backgrounds for a long time, but this shift to generative AI is a completely different class of thing, I think. And, and, and I think, you know, that's what we're seeing. Like the minute generative AI appeared on the scene, the interest or the kind of hype scale around uh, AI went from about a three on a scale of one to 10 to like 11, <laughs> 12. Um, what's the difference? Like what's changed? I mean, I think, when the, you know, some of the examples that what, particularly that you two mentioned, a lot of people aren't aware that they're already using AI every day. Machine learning has been at work uh, in media organizations for, for ages in terms of metadata and, and understanding um, how to classify and organize information. It's actually been used in org media organizations to write uh, structured articles and summaries for some time. Um, so what's new? What's changed? Let's start at that end. Gideon. I mean, I, I think what's changed is that it now has the capability to, to produce something that looks like something humans would create from scratch. And I emphasize looks like because it's very clear that what's going on is imitation. Uh, generative AI, when it, we're talking about something like ChatGPT, is stringing together sequences of words that, are, that look like sequences of words that other people have written, and that's why they appear very convincing, but as we all know, um, it's not rooted in understanding of the world or uh, factuality. It's, it's literally just copying sequences or, or using statistics to, f to produce sequences of words that look like things that already are, are on the internet. Um, but I think it, because it looks so impressive superficially, people is, is why there's been so much excitement about it. And also the fact that it became available as an easy to use interface was what the, the thing that really was crucial 
with ChatGPT and also with some of the image generation models because this technology was around already for a few years, but it wasn't that easy to access. And the big change last year was just that it became easy to access. Harry, what do you think changed? Yeah, I mean, um, I'd say the biggest thing is that today AI can not only help me, but theoretically re replace me. Uh, no I mean, one could replace no. me. I imagine I'll get better at that over the coming years. I, I'd say the other thing that's new and um, potentially a good thing is that um, you know, the idea of using AI to help brainstorm stories or throw, give you a, a few possible headlines or fill out your boring SEO fields in your CMS is now feasible. And uh, at least theoretically, the, the more I can help with that, the more time I might have for the stuff that only a human can do today. Do you think there's been a, a sea change? I, I do. I think there's been a sea change, but, you know, I, I think if we look at, you know, our journalists and our editors around the world, I, you know, there's a very personal scope that goes into everything somebody is writing and somebody is speaking about. And I think that's a really big component when you look at a chat GPT technology, as Gideon was saying, that it's, you know, it's bringing up a set of words. It's able to say, look, it's 500 words on X topic regarding this, but it's not the way that I would infuse that information into the world, right? And it's not those types of things that make organic journalism and, and all of the real nuggets that we get from it um, really critical. So I think that's a really important you know, element. I think for the drafting process and the information gathering, certainly saving a lot of time, but um, you know, we're certainly on the path of that being a still a very personal uh, end state product. Well, since you said that, I have you created, uh, I know you have, Gideon, but any, any guidelines around the use of AI uh, for your workflow, for your editorial processes, your creative processes? A absolutely. I think, you know, certainly the, the auto-summarization and the auto-translation components um, have really been key, and they've been there, you know, in terms of us being able to really drive headlines prolifically. But, you know, very much from, you know, our editorial standpoint and even from my news aggregation business, um, we're not actively bringing in generative AI components into, into that flow flows of yet, and we are very copyright and very source driven, particularly from a news aggregation perspective. So we want to know that these derivative works are coming from the sources and coming from the editorial team that they're coming from. So we're in very kind of, I would say, a conservative stance in terms of how we're. And you've applying. actually codified that in your organization. Yes. Um, Gideon, what about you? I know you guys came out with some guidelines. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, after CNET had its debacle with the publishing AI-generated articles then turned out to be full of errors, I thought it was important for us to just um, set expectations and have some clarity, some transparency about what we wouldn't, more like, more specifically, what we wouldn't be using AI for, because I think establishing trust is really important. And um, so for us, we simply said we're not, going to use generative AI to write stories or parts of stories. We might use it to suggest ideas for headlines. We'll experiment with it for doing things like research and see if it's any good. So far, it hasn't been very much good for our purposes. Um, we are now allowing artists who we would have commissioned previously to make art uh, non using not generative AI. If they're using those tools, we'll, we, we will commission work from them using those tools, but we won't use those tools to replace work that might have been done by human artists. And I think for us, kind of the basic principle is that you, sh you know, wherever possible, we should be using this as a tool that augments human capabilities rather than replacing them. But I think as far as, you know, the, what, as far as using it for generating stories, the problem is, r becomes again that A, it, it's, it just it produces fairly mediocre text that, is, that looks like everything else and so it doesn't stand out, and B, that it, it has no conception of factuality. There's no way for it yeah to produce text that, that is reliable. So for now, at least, we think of it as something that does not substitute for that work. Harry, do you guys have uh, any guidelines underway? Well, um, credit where credit is due. We, we took note of what Gideon and Wired did, and we're impressed that you uh, not only figured out some of this stuff, but told your readers what your philosophies were. Um, we are, we've formed a task force for AI, which um, includes representatives from editorial, of course, but, but also folks from our, our sales side, audience development, our CEO, because um, as many questions as there are about AI's impact on journalism, I, I'd say there are equally important ones for other aspects of the media business. And so we are, are meeting and um, we'll have at some point um, some guidelines and we'll tell our readers about them. And um, also, it feels like you can't set one set of guidelines and expect that they will makes sense a few years from now. So I, I think that AI task for forces probably have to exist 
on an ongoing basis rather than being able to come up with some rules and, and then say, all set from now on. So small plug uh, at digitalcontentnext.org where I work. Today we published a piece where we talked to a lot of editorial leaders about how they're developing their editorial guidelines. And Harry brought up a couple of things that, that we saw over and over. One is the, the idea of the, this being, not being a fixed document, that the technology is evolving rapidly and that we're all going to have to remain flexible. Um, but also, you know, uh, that uh, you need a lot, of, a lot of players, a lot of key constituents from your organization involved so that you're looking at this not just from a, a threat perspective or a, or a legal perspective, but looking at it holistically. You guys, um, now that you all have policies in place and you're ready to, to go out in the world and use AI in your organizations, I thought it might be interesting to do kind of a quick, like a speed round where you tell me, like I name, I name uh, something you might do in a media organization and you tell me if you would, wouldn't, or might in the future use AI mm -hmm. to do this. So we're gonna do this really quickly. We can just go down the line. Summarizing a school board meeting. Yes, we would use AI. Yes, with help from a human. I'd be skeptical right now that it would be capable of summarizing it accurately or picking out the things that matter. I'm going to take that as a no, probably <laughs> <Thank> no. <laughs> All right. Uh, how about drafting um, the, the records from an earnings call? Mm, no, I would lean more towards no using it to gather information, but absolutely reviewed and written by a human. AI is actually pretty bad at math, so I, I would be concerned about anything <laughs> where, where, where the news involved numbers and, and fact-checking that might be more work than uh, just doing it yourself. If I said no on the last thing, it would be perverse for me to say yes on this one. So <laughs> <with> my colleagues. <laughs> All right, how about um, drafting social media posts? <sighs> oh, that's a tough one. I actually like to draft my own social media posts, so I'm going to go with a no. I think, I think um, brainstorming them. Makes sense. Not, not, not turning the job over to an AI anytime soon, though. Yeah, similarly, social media posts and with headlines, I think you could, you could have it throw out a bunch of options very quickly, um, but then you really need a human to look at which of those are actually compelling and, yeah, headlines and, and was, accurate. Headlines was another one I had on the list. Mm. Would, would brainstorm headlines, right? Yeah. But have a human look at it. How about generating code for your website? Your yeah. app? That seems to be something, I mean, the, the nice thing about code and the reason I think this, part of the reason I think there's so much excitement about generative AI in general is that it seems to work really well for code and that's because code follows certain structures and patterns. Code you can also run and you can do tests on. And so it, you know, because of both those reasons it actually can save human coders a lot of time. I mean, it's already transformed our people code, st stuff like um, GitHub's Copilot. And as far as I can tell, it, it's all good and coders have really embraced that and it is helping them be more efficient and effective and focus more on, on the, the most important parts of what they do. Yep, yep. I'm gonna go three for three and I'm gonna agree with them. Uh, we're, we're all gonna <laughs> use it for that. Um, so uh, what if we point AI internally at your own body of work? Um, would you trust it to do trend analysis or trend identification? Bing, 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 it flags it for your editors. Hey, look at this trend. When, yeah. you, say, when you say trend, and of what you mean? So you know how, I mean, you know how these wacky human journalists will just be kind of aware that something is bubbling, 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 and suddenly they say, you know what, you guys, we really need to do a story on um, generative AI in the automotive industry. Um, uh, that sounds like a terrible story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I'm a machine, so it doesn't count. <laughs> I mean, I think, so, AI for spotting trends in a body of material, like, let's say, the frequency of mentions of some company, hmm. I mean, you don't even need AI for that of any kind. You certainly don't need generative AI, right. but you can, you know, you can, you can do it, you can do data analysis of some kind on the body of work that you've published. But I feel like the things that give journalists an edge when they say I've spotted a trend is not that they think mm, I've written about this thing five times in the last six months. It's those four people that I've spoken to privately off the record that nobody knows about in the last few months. They all said this one thing that echoes to me and it's that, that human connection, that being able to pick up trends from your conversations, that's, that's how you get the edge over other people. So maybe it's not that much of a strong 
fools. That was not a speed round answer, but no. Sorry. I'm going to give you <laughs> I'm going to give you half a point for that one. Um, what do you guys say? Like, do you th would you trust it at this point ever? Do you think it could do that piece of for me, that, that's a nuanced piece of being a journalist. And I think what we see is that AI lacks nuance um, and, in some cases, any sense of fact or accuracy. We, um, I mean, we already, already use things like Google Trends to just get data on you know, what's out there. Um, it's a relatively crude tool. It, it certainly does not replace editorial um, oversight, but it, I think that AI might be helpful in the same way that Google Trends has, just as sort of a rough barometer that is sometimes helpful, but no replacement to talking to human beings. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree, too. I think the <laughs> training component from an end state, right, with, with an actual personal element, I, I don't know if that's there. I think that's fraught with that term I know inordinately well now, hallucinations. Um, but we all I, have them. We all have them, yes, actually. <laughs> this is one right now. Um, so, you know, we're, we are using it, we are using things like sentiment indication and backtesting and kind of predictive analytics. So I think, you know, certainly that comes from maybe trends feeding into articles. All right, so let's shift gears a little bit. Um, thank you, by the way. I, I actually very much enjoy that there's a little bit of consensus here because it feels like we're going to move together in a really positive and constructive direction. So, love it. Um, we've heard of late that uh, some big tech leaders, some really smart folks, um, s call, call this, this generation, generative AI, an existential threat. <laughs> are, are we afraid? Should we be afraid? And I don't just mean as the media. You guys all think about larger issues in society. Is this good? Is it bad? Should we all be scared? I think the um, <laughs> worrying about it blowing up the world or killing us all is a, a little overwrought, particularly because there's a, a pretty long list of genuine concerns that are either an issue right now or pretty clearly will be over the next few years involving things like misinformation. Um, there are huge privacy concerns with a handful of large companies grabbing all our data and synthesizing it for their, their own benefit. So I, I'd say there are plenty of things to worry about with AI, but um, not so much destroying the world. Maybe more like um, in the same way that social media has in a lot of ways degraded the human experience. AI might as well, along with all the great things about it as well. Don't worry, we'll get to the good stuff. I'm not going to end on the negative. I know you have something. <laughs> Look, I think the fact that the people warning of the most severe apocalyptic existential threats are themselves technologists mm -hmm. tells you something because it, it comes from a place of excessive belief in the power of technology. And I agree with Harry. Like, you know, the, the Skynet scenario, not going to happen. The misinformation flooding, definitely a, 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 high, a high risk. The general, um, can I say this word, enshittification of the internet. We can oh. absolutely say enshittification. <laughs> um, the, you know, the, the, the increasing volume of just sheer garbage that is out there that is going to be generated by AI, that's a, that's a real worry. And it's already, even before generative AI, is degrading the, the quality of search engines and of, the, of information out there. So that is a thing that I worry about. And the job displacement part is also a thing that I worry about because I think it, there is a way to use it, and people have written about this, there is a way to use AI that, as I said, empowers people, gives them extra tools, but it's also a great temptation for companies, for employers, to simply look at it as a way to save costs. We've seen big media organizations already say they're going to make massive cuts. Right. Right. Yay, we can save money, we can fire all these journalists. Again, right. change changes jobs. I mean, these kind of big, these big changes transform work. And some jobs inevitably are going to be lost, but I think, I think you can make choices that cause more, more of these applications of AI to empower people than to simplify them. Yeah. So, um, is, do you guys think that there's a risk that, so we're talking a lot about using the tools to empower journalists as, as a new tool in our, in our repertoire that will allow us to save time and focus on the work that's great. Wonderful. I love that. I love that. That sounds so positive. But is there a risk that uh, reliance on generative technologies could lead to the erosion of human judgment, to critical, erosion of critical thinking, or, uh, or even creativity? We're already seeing that happen. I mean, there, there's that great story about the lawyer who 
um, had ChatGPT write a brief for him and turned it over to the judge without checking it out. Um, I'd say in a lot of ways the biggest issue is not computers doing stupid things, but humans <laughs> doing stupid things with computers. And um, we will always have that problem no matter how much better AI gets. That and is. some of those people will be journalists. Yeah. Yep. That is accurate. Yeah. <laughs> that, is, that is painfully accurate. <laughs> I'll get I'll get a little bit kind of you know philosophical about it, and also admit something about me personally. I'm a pop culture junkie, so I'm always kind of cruising through the social medias. And I came across a meme that Ethan Hawke was speaking on on a top on the topic of creativity, and it was a very interesting. I would honestly say to to go look at it because it was speaking about creativity in everyday lives. Is always a question of what value does less human creativity bring, whether you're talking journalism or art or music or all these other very creative endeavors. But then when there's a moment in your life of challenge, of true change, of kind of pivoting mindset, you go to those creative places. You go to a very human element. So I found it just very interesting as we're looking at all of these from a very professional landscape. It is when you face that kind of change in, in your personal life, a human is what you're um, looking towards and you're looking for those very unique elements to support, to rectify, to manage your mindset, all sorts of things. So I'm, I'm hopeful. I do think we're going to have just as any other change that's been happening from an ecological or, you know, an economic or a social component, we're going to have those changes in jobs, but it's about what can we do uh, on top of that? I think people, there's the risk of people being lazy mm -hmm. with whatever you give them. And before AI, we saw people being lazy by relying on Wikipedia, um, uh, or on just you know doing using the internet and not doing actual reporting, not like not calling sources. So generative AI just provides one more way in which people can be lazy, but it is still the people who go the extra mile and make the effort who be beat their com beat their competition. Yeah. So yeah. One of the things you mentioned to me when we were talking about this, Gideon, was the homogeny, the potential for a homogenous voice. Mm. Uh, do you think that, that when we lean further and further into AI tools for our writing? Yes. Then we run the risk of being homogeneous, but then ex again, the, the people who make the effort to be different are the ones who, I think, get the edge. Um, there is, and you know, let's not f forget that for a lot of uses of writing that are not journalism and not creative writing, it doesn't matter. Sure, fine, have a homogeneous voice for your marketing emails or for your corporate communications. All right, and if AI can save you time in doing those, great. Uh, but when it's necessary to stand out, that's when you want to, that's when you want to rely on your human intuition. Journalism is unusual in that the writing is the product. Most of the writing that exists in the world is not the product. And, it's just the tool. And, yeah. and probably there are a lot of cases where having a computer draft your internal memo or whatever makes a lot of sense and will free you up to do more important things. All right, let's end, uh, let's end with, are you more excited or anxious about the potential of generative AI to positively impact the media? I'm more anxious. More anxious. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of a worried optimist, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go with the anxious optimist as well. I think we have a lot to learn, and it's going to be just accelerating. We have a lot to learn, and uh, what I am most excited about is seeing that in this case of transformative technology, the media is stepping up. We want to be involved. We have a seat at the table, and we're gonna, we're gonna, I feel like we are going to use these tools for good because we are going to take control and use them well. So thank you all for your time. Thank you guys. Thank you. Such a good chat.